I invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read Psalm 8 just to start, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in. We're going to spend a bit of time. Uh, We were in Genesis chapter 1 last week. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 this week. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 next week, Lord willing. So we're spending a bit of time here because there's important things to learn from the book of Genesis, and especially Genesis 1. Psalm 8 says this. This is David, the psalm writer, and he says, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversities in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth that it contains. We thank you for the fact that it's your very words to us. And as we were reminded last week that you created all things. And that you created them in six days and you created them by your power and your might and your majesty. God, as we are confronted this morning by the fact that we were created in your image. I pray that you would help us understand what that means and the gravity of it, and that it would impact our lives, not just for the few minutes that we're here this morning, but as we go from this place, that we would be image bearers of God to a world that desperately needs to see that. So God, I pray that you would guide my words and my thoughts, that they would be honoring to you, that they would be right, that they would be exactly what needs to be said today from your word in Christ's name, amen. Now, I I started with Psalm 8 because Psalm 8, in the psalm, the psalm writer says some things that relate back to the passage that we're going to be working with. He actually says a a few more things than we're going to deal with this morning, but Lord willing, we'll tackle next week. But I did want to see, read these verses again and just draw your attention to them as we then look at Genesis chapter 1. It says this, it says, When I observe your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him and a son of man that you would look after him? And then he says this, You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. That's what the psalm writer says. He's really talking about the fact that we as human beings were created in the image of God. That's the way the psalm writer says it. In Genesis, Moses records it this way for us. I want you to look at verses 26 and 27. We talked about the fact that God created specific things in the days preceding this. We already talked about the fact that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were actively involved as the triune God in the work of creation. One pastor said this, and I love the way that he put it when he was approaching this passage, talking about man being created the way that we were created. He said this when God created the sun, moon, and stars. He says uh, in verse 16, God made two lights, two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, we would call it the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon, as well as the stars, or, and the stars also, some translations recorded. 
You know that God is amazing when the stars of the universe are kind of an afterthought. And he created the universe, he created the sun, he created the moon. Oh yeah, and he created the stars. There are billions and billions and billions of stars. We can't count them. They're billions of light years away. And the, song, and the, the writer of Genesis just says, yeah, and he, and he made the stars too. And that kind of a God in verse 26 and 27 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And we're going to stop there. There's, there's a lot in this passage, and there's a lot that follows that we will get into. There's something called the dominion mandate that is given to mankind here that eventually that we're going to get to, but we're not going to get to that today. What we are going to talk about is the fact that right off the bat in Genesis chapter 1, we are told something very specific about human beings, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. This is actually more profound than maybe we think it is. Maybe we haven't really thought about it too much. Maybe we have misunderstood this. And yet all of us wrestle with very important questions of life. One of those questions being, what is my purpose? Why am I here? And belief system after belief system seeks to answer that question. A worldview at its core is something that seeks to answer the big questions of life. And one of those questions is, why am I here? What's my purpose? The Bible makes it abundantly clear what our purpose is, and it's tied to this particular passage, but I want us to see it. But before I do, I want us to know, and I want us to be reminded of, and I'm sure that we already realize it, but maybe we don't always think about it, but we as human beings tend to, when we think of ourselves, do one of two things. We either elevate ourselves to the place of God, or we debase ourselves to the place of animals. We don't get it right. We either do or one or the other. Scripture makes it abundantly clear how we were made, why we were made, what is our purpose. And we, when we think of that very first question that's tied up in this, why am I here, what is my purpose, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that my purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is why I'm here as a human being. Amen. The the Westminster Shorter Catechism words it this way as it seeks to teach Christians the core doctrine of, of Scripture. The question is this, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Isaiah 43, 7 says this, Everyone who bears my name is created for my glory. I formed them, indeed I have made them. A statement by God to Isaiah 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says this, So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. That is what we are to be all about. Romans eleven thirty six ends a prayer this way. Paul, in his prayer in that passage, says this at the very end, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Speaking of God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. We are here to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is why we exist as human beings. The problem is this. We've lost sight of that. We've lost sight of that because sin entered the picture. And yet we're not quite there yet because we will get to that reality in Genesis chapter 3. But at this point, 
in Genesis chapter 1, this is what we're taught. We're taught that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together said, you know what, we're going to make man, and we're going to make man in our image. We're going to make him after our likeness. And so we have to ask the question, what does it mean then to be made in the image of God? And if we're going to ask that question, we need to first of all make sure that we understand what it doesn't mean. Being created in the image of God does not mean this, that we do not possess. So what it doesn't mean is what some Eastern philosophies what some prosperity teachers teach, that we are little gods, that we have a spark of divinity in us. Some prosperity teachers go as far as to say that because we have that little bit of God's essence in us, that we can literally speak things into creation. Absolutely not. There is absolutely nothing in Scripture that teaches that. God is the creator, I am not. I don't possess, nor do you, God's incommunicable, incommunicable attributes. That's a hard word to say. Like his omniscience, we don't know all things. His omnipresence, we're not everywhere all the time. His omnipotence, we are not all-powerful. We are not transcendent. We are confined by space and time. We are not God. And we need to stop trying to act like we are. But we are also not animals. And so the opposite of that oftentimes is we think too highly of ourselves and we try to say, oh, we're little gods. We have a little spark of divinity in us, all of us. And if we don't go that far, then we buy into the other mainline teaching in our culture, which is that we are just more evolved animals, and so really we just reside with the animals. Like that one preacher put it, we don't reside with the animals, we preside over the animals. And we'll get to that next week, Lord willing, but we're not going to talk about that today. We are going to talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. What does it mean to be an image bearer of God? If, it, if we know what it doesn't mean, then we need to know what it does mean. There are three areas that we understand this. Different preachers, different theologians, different scholars may word it a little differently, but they're essentially the same thing. Uh, at my ordination council, when I, was taught, when I was asked questions about this, I answered by saying that we, we were created with intellect, emotions, and will. I, I've since learned that it's much more robust than that. That's a pretty simple description when people say, hey, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? We do have intellect, we do have emotions, we do have will. But it's even more than that. Number one, what does it mean that we are created in the image of God? First and foremost, we are created as rational beings as God is rational. What does that mean that we have intelligence and will we engage in, and I love how R.C. Sproul put it, he says we engage in knowing, reasoning, reflecting, and understanding. We as human beings, we think, we reason, we reflect. Part of that is wrapped up in the fact that we possess creativity. I think of some of the structures that have been designed by human beings. They're creative in the way that they design certain things. I joke around with one of my sons who works for an architectural firm and they, he does the, the drawings for these things and he likes to you know, be involved whenever he can be in the design portion of it. And I always give him a hard time about how architectures, architects' homes look the weirdest. Why can't they just make an ordinary looking house? There's always got to be some weird thing. A little weird design here, a little round staircase that doesn't seem all that practical or this and that and the other. Why? Because they're creative. And they love to demonstrate that creativity in what they design. 
Look at some of the most amazing portraits that have ever been painted. I personally like Rembrandt. I'll never own a Rembrandt. But Rembrandt actually painted a, a, a picture of Christ being crucified, hanging on the cross, and he actually put himself as one of the individuals at the foot of the cross. Because Rembrandt understood that Jesus Christ died for him. It's a beautiful picture. Because he was an extremely creative individual and he was gifted to paint. As human beings, we are given that creativity by God. We have immense creative ability. We have the ability to reason and understand and reflect. That sometimes is used for God's glory, but much of the time today it's used for our own glory and to tear down the name of God. Like God, God demonstrated his vast intelligence and will in creation. God actually formed plans and he executed those plans. God said, let there be and there was. And he designed it with purpose and with structure and with meaning and with design. It's one of the things that throws people off who don't want to acknowledge that God created all things as they look at us and, and other animals or other parts of creation and they'll say, but look at the similarities, all the chromosomes that human beings have that are the same as. I just think it's funny because sometimes scientists, when they start thinking along those lines and start rational or reasoning things out from a creation perspective, did you know that if we really were going to evolve based on chromosome count, we would eventually become ferns? Just saying. Ferns have more chromosomes than we do. I don't want to be a fern. Just saying. But yet, there is design. There's, there's similarity in God's creative work because God's intelligent and he had plans and he executed those plans and they work within the science and the math and the structures that he created. But I want us to think about it for a second. We try to sometimes argue that, well, you know, we're not really a whole lot different than animals. You know, when we use things like personality, and we'll talk about our, rash, uh, our relational nature in a minute, but they'll say, well, we have personality. If you say, well, we're unique because human beings have personality, and they'll say, yeah, but my dog has personality. It's not my dog. It's my son's dog. It just seems to live at my house all the time. And it's got plenty of personality. But you know what? It doesn't have reason and reflecting and understanding. How do I know this? Because it eats its own excrement. <laughs> it's not a smart dog. It's a beautiful dog. It's a lot of fun. She's not very smart. We would reason and reflect and say, this is not a good idea. I don't think I'm going to do that. I love how Adrian Rogers puts it. Animals are only interested in self-gratification, self-preservation, and self-propagation. We weren't created to be like animals. We were created in the image and likeness of God. And because we're rational beings, that's why we struggle with irrational things. And so when people in our society continually push more and more irrational things, and I'm just going to say it, when I stand up and say that I can, as a man, become a woman that is not rational, that is not God's creative design, and when we look at it from God's perspective and we look at it in light of the truth of Scripture, we say, this doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because God created us to be rational, reflective, intelligent, creative beings made in the image of God. And God made it very clear in His creation that He created us male and female. In the image of God, he created them. 
Which goes to the second thing that I want to say. We're relational or personal beings as God is relational. I want you to see this for a second with me. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, after God makes it abundantly clear that he created man in his image, after his likeness, he created the male and female. In Genesis chapter 2, as relational beings, what did God do? He created the man and woman, Adam and Eve. And what did he do? He set up the very first marriage. This is how a man and a woman are supposed to have an intimate relationship in the grounds of marriage. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds to his wife and the two become one flesh. Both man and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. They were designed and created to be relational beings. God is a relational being. Did you know that God was in complete constant eternal fellowship before the foundations of the world between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, again, as human beings, tend to try to put ourselves on the same level as God. And we say, you know what, God created us because he wanted to have a relationship with us. No, God didn't need a relationship with us. God was in constant eternal fellowship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created us so that we could have a relationship with Him. He didn't create us because He needed a relationship with us. It's a popular Christian song that sometimes is sung. We've sung it before. We try not to sing it now. I'll be honest. Because one of the lines is, God didn't want heaven without us, so He brought heaven down. That's a pretty self-centered, me-centered line in, in, a, in a song. And it's not actually biblically accurate. God created us to be able to have a relationship with Him. Jesus spoke of this loving relationship that Father, Son, through Holy Spirit had in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, it says this, Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am so that they may see your glory, or my glory, excuse me, that they may see my glory, which you have given to me because you loved me before the world's foundation. See, God is a relation, relational God, and he created us to be relational beings. And yet... If you think about our human relationships, we constantly attack the relationships that God has established. You see that again in Genesis chapter 5, we see the relational nature of us as human beings. It says in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, it says, This is the document containing the family records of Adam. On that day God created man, he made them in, in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, reiterated once again. When they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness, according to his image, named Seth. See, as human beings, we were created in God's image after his likeness. And we are to reflect God. We are image bearers of God. You know, our children tend to be image bearers of us. But Adam couldn't have had children if he didn't have a close, intimate relationship with his wife, and they did exactly what God called them to do, be fruitful and multiply. And as he enjoyed a close relationship with his wife, he began to foster a relationship with his children because we're relational beings. Because God is a relational God. We constantly undermine the relational structures that God has laid out for us. Husband and wife. One man, one woman for one lifetime. And what do we say? No, that's not good enough. I should have as many partners as I want. I should be able to scrap this marriage if I don't want it. If it's not meeting my needs. If it's not living up to what I thought it was going to be. If it's this, that, and the other. And every time we undermine a relationship that God has ordained, we're attacking the very image of God. Because God established relationships the way that he designed those relationships to be. 
Number three, God created us in his image. And what does that mean? We are moral as God is moral. Now, you have to take a step back for a second here. You have to remember that at this point in Genesis, sin has not entered the picture. If we look at that now, we would say, hold on a second. I know my own morality. If God's like that, I don't want that kind of God. We need to remember that when God created man, when he created Adam and Eve, before sin entered the picture, they were sinless people. Sin hadn't entered the picture. It hadn't corrupted and polluted everything. They had a perfect, intimate relationship with Almighty God. They didn't know the destructive nature of sin because it hadn't entered the picture. But you know what? They were moral individuals. They had the capacity to do what was right. They were righteous when they were created God is the authority of all morality. He established the parameters in which mankind was to live. This is what he said right off the bat. In this original creation, man was free. He had freedom. But you know what? His freedom wasn't just free to do whatever he wanted. It was freedom to do exactly what God said within the parameters of what God said. God says this, look, I have given you Well, first of all, he says, be fruitful and multiply. There's one parameter, do this. And man was free to do that within the confines of a marriage relationship. Maybe confines is not the right word, but I mean it in the best possible way. But then he says in verse 29, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant and every tree whose fruit contains seeds for, for food for you. Hey, look, you can have all of these trees that are bearing fruit. This is food for you. You're welcome to have it all. In chapter 2, he said, it tells us that he has one restriction. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree. Pretty simple. God didn't set up any tricks, anything like that. It was pretty simple. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree. All the rest, enjoy. Tend the garden. Look after it for me. I've given this to you, he says. In verse 30. Verse 15, chapter 2, it says, The Lord took man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And then he says, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day that you eat of it, you will certainly die. Pretty clear. God set the moral parameters for Adam and Eve. This is what you're free to do. This is what you can't do. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve, in chapter 3, we'll learn about it, rebelled against God. They plunged all mankind into sin and corruption, and sin has polluted everything since then. Sin dehumanizes man. It devalues man. That's what sin does. We were created with dignity and value, and yet because of sin, we now cast off any dignity that we might be made with. We devalue human beings. We mistreat one another. We talked about the fact that the money that we raised at VBS was to go to the International Justice Mission. Why? So that we could help families get out of slavery. Why does slavery exist? Because sinful human beings devalue human beings. I'm going to sell this child so that I can get a bunch of money out of them. Some of you may have seen a movie recently that dealt with that subject. And one of the lines in that movie that is one of the most devastating to hear when the question was asked about child slavery and so on and whether somebody actually literally said it or whether that's just the attitude, it's still true. You sell drugs once, but you can sell a child multiple times a day. Sinful human beings devalue humans. We treat each other like animals because why? Our society has told us that that's all we are for years and years and years. And God says, no, I made you in my image after my likeness. You have immense value to me. Why? Because Jesus was willing to die on a cross to save us from our sin. Because we're that valuable to God. We see that in Genesis chapter 9. 
where God talks about taking human life. He says this in chapter 9, verse 5, and I will require a penalty for your life blood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood by humans, his blood will be shed for God made humans in his image. God immensely values human beings. And even in this, we have moved away from that as human beings. We don't value one another. I just, for my own education, just searched on Google some headlines about human beings taking one another's lives because we see that in so many different ways, whether that's through abortion, taking the life of an unborn child, or medical assistance in dying, taking the life of somebody who says that they don't want to live anymore. What's ironic is our world and our sinfulness tries to paint those things in the best possible light. Hey, it's your choice. Or, hey, let's give somebody dignity in dying. What are we doing? We're throwing that in the face of God who actually sees man in his dignity. And I looked up online just one story after another, news article after another of someone just senselessly taking the life of somebody else over nothing, property, because they are angry, because somebody cheated on them, because of money, because of whatever, because they just don't care about human beings. Because they don't understand that they were created in the image of God and that mankind is supposed to be an image bearer of God. Like how Ligon Duncan put it, the image of God has not been erased, but it has been effaced. What do we do as Christians if we understand that we are created in the image of God? See, we wrestle with this stuff. I think of James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. James says this, With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. The Lord really spoke to me through that because I'm... I'm guilty of that, just like everybody else is. With my words, I'm literally tearing apart somebody who was created in the image of God. And James says, this just shouldn't be the way, folks. And yet God calls us as Christians to live in the image of God, I want you to see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Paul says this, and there's a parallel passage in Colossians, and I'm going to read in a second, but he's talking about the new life that we have in Christ. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are to live a new way. We aren't to live like we, we did when we were sinners. We are to live like Christ, and he says this, and to put on the new self the one created according to God's likeness. You know what? As Christians, we are to all that much more live in the image of God. We are to be the image bearers of God, the way that God has called us to live. We are to live in our new selves, in God's likeness, in righteousness and purity of truth, or holiness as some translations call it. I am called as a Christian to live righteously, to live holy. Why? Because that's the way that God created me to live. Amen. And as I live that way, I reflect the image of Almighty God. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, this is what Paul says to the church of Colossians, and do not lie to one another. Interesting that he uses that phrase when he's talking about the fact that we, when we are not treating each other like we were created in the image of God, we lie to, to each other. We're not holding up the truth. We're deceiving people like the devil does. But he says, since you have put off the old self 
with its practices and have put on the new self, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. The more we get to know God as followers of Jesus Christ, the more that we live in the image of God the more that we are image bearers of God to the world around us. But that means that we need to be getting to know God to the best of our ability, spending time with him in his word, spending time in prayer, fellowshipping with other believers so that we get to know God as intimately as we possibly can. Why? So that we can bear his image well to a world that, that, that doesn't see it anymore. They've defaced the image of God, and they need to see the image of God for what it is again. I'm going to end with this. How can that be restored? How can it be restored? Well, as we reflect the image of God, that's one way. But it goes back to Matthew 28 for me, which is God's purpose for the church. What has God called all of us as Christians to do? He says this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That is our purpose as believers on this planet. It is not to make my life better. It is not to live as comfortably as I possibly can. It's not to have the best job that I can. It's because God has called me to go and make disciples of all nations. The only way that God, God's image can be born to a sinful world is that more and more people come to know Christ as Savior and bear that image out the way that God always intended it. And God has put me in my job wherever that might be. Maybe that's hauling garbage from somewhere. Maybe that's designing new buildings. But God has placed me in those places so that I can bear God's image well to the people who need to see it. Because they need Jesus to save them. And they need to reflect the fact that they were made in the image of God. Teaching them, excuse me, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. I'm going to close with this thought. I was reading just recently Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well. You know, that woman really wasn't treated with a whole lot of dignity. In the middle of the day, she's going out and getting water from the well when nobody else was around. Why? Because she lived a lifestyle that wasn't pleasing in the community. And people didn't really treat her all that well. And yet Jesus specifically went through Samaria so that he could have a conversation with that lady, so that he could tell her about himself. She was guilty, like so many of us of effacing the image of God. What was she doing? She was living with a guy that wasn't her husband. She'd been married five times. She had ruined that image of relationship that God had designed for human beings. And yet Jesus loved her so much to meet her at the well and say, hey, I'd like to tell you about who I am. Why? Because she was valuable to Jesus. Her soul was valuable to Jesus. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as Savior, you know what? You are made in the image of God. God loves you. You're valuable to Him. He wants you to have a close personal relationship with Him by confessing your sin before Him and trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. Would you enter into that relationship with Him today? Talk to me after the service. I'd love to talk to you more about that. We're going to sing a hymn in just a minute. In light of, hopefully, what the Holy Spirit has laid on our hearts, being created in the image of God, we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. I'm just going to read you the three of the stanzas of this hymn. It says this, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand has made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin.
And when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art.